Our second speaker today is Madhav Mani from Northwestern. Madhav was trained uh, in mathematics and theoretical physics. And I don't know when he became interested in biology, but we're very glad that he did. Um, and his interests are really varied in biological processes. He's collaborated with a wide range of different um, biologists asking lots of different questions. And in fact, I don't even know really what you're gonna talk about today, Madhav. Um, oh, something maybe with the Drosophila eye in collaboration with Richard Carthew, but he's worked oh. on tissue patterning and tissue mechanics. Um, and today we'll learn about hidden symmetries in final form. Great. Thanks for being here, so Madhav. Thank you so much, Danelle. Um, it's a great lineup to be a part of. I feel like I don't really uh, let's hope I can uh, show you something interesting and something different. So most importantly, uh, this has been a, a sort of long collaboration with involving Vasil Alba, a very talented postdoc who's, um, who's done the bulk of this work, and Rich Carthew, who is uh, a friend and a colleague and uh, allowed such crazy projects to actually ensue in our collaboration. So um, um, I've put up the Vitruvian Man just because we, as people that study developmental biology, focus on, sometimes think about final form, and we think about a sort of idealized final form with symmetries and things like this. Um, this talk is going to take a slightly different approach on symmetries. Instead of looking at the symmetries manifest in a single final form, we're going to take a statistical look at uh, final form, in particular the variants that are produced by a developmental program in a population. Um, so perhaps slight evolutionary angle to this project. Um, so just um, the project is not going to be about human faces, but, but nonetheless, just to start off with, our eyes are very, very good at discerning faces. Um, I think so we have various parts in our brain that are actually developed uh, to, to do that, that discernment. Um, so there's clearly a lot of variety that is produced by some sort of core developmental program, and yet we, we can recognize a human from another species. Uh, so clearly there are constraints. So there's variation, but there are constraints as well. That's not surprising. This is biology 101, um, uh, that, that you always have sort of both of these things. You have variation, variants that are produced for the process of evolution to actually get started, but stability of species uh, to ensure that you actually have um, um, sort of demarcations. Um, so the question that uh, I wanted to ask was, can we parameterize the space of varieties uh, that a developmental program can generate by looking at many thousands of outcomes? Um, so this is, again, ancient problem. Uh, uh, in, in, you know, Darwin published several books on, on looking at barnacles and famously said, I'm sick of them, uh, because, uh, what, you know, he, he, you know, came from this background. At the time, the tradition was that there's an ideal that there's an ideal barnacle and all barnacles, you know, they really are trying to be that ideal perfect barnacle, but they just sort of fell short because, oh, you know, life is, life is tough. Um, but, but in, in, you know, he, he said sort of, he's been struck with the amount of variability, even very slight degrees that, that you see in these barnacles. Um, so variation is clearly important, but then skip ahead many, many years, um, many decades, um, and um, you have a very different point of view, which was put forward by Waddington, which was actually, he suggested that, yeah, well, variation is important. You need it for evolution, but I don't think you're going to get very different varieties if you change the conditions, meaning if you change the genes a little bit and little bit, I'm gonna to try to talk quantitatively about what a little bit might be, or you change the environment a little bit, you're kind of gonna end up with the similar thing. In fact, he thought very similar things. So. So while, while Darwin said, you know, variation must be there, Waddington sort of said, well, but there must be constraints, and there are constraints. And in fact, if you change things a little bit in the process in these developmental reactions, things aren't going to change that much when you talk about phenotype, uh, the result, the outcome. Um, so that's what this, this project is about. The approach is going to be one that was inspired by many, many conversations um, with, with Boris over the years, uh, not just when I was a postdoc, but even since then. Um, which was the theory of transformations in Darcy Thompson. And of course, in, 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 that, in that chapter, in that book, he talks about um, looking at different species and finding maps from different species by looking at the deformation of landmarks. And he kind of posited by using sort of caricatures that perhaps those, those, those maps are smooth and understandable, and perhaps those maps will encode something deep 
uh, he didn't think about genes, but perhaps about the genetic regulation of how you produce varieties. I'm going to do a very different approach. I'm just going to look at hundreds and thousands of outcomes of a developmental program, meaning not across species, but within a species, where I'm perturbing it, the, the genome of those, uh, of those organisms, and I'm perturbing the environment in which development happened. I'm going to look at thousands of replicates, and I am going to now try to, in some senses, do what Darcy Thompson did, but now where the variation is much smaller, right? Variation is now individual to individual variation, and I'm going to do those, and I'm now going to look at the properties of those maps that emerge and try to relate them uh, to each other. So, so that's the sort of approach I'll be taking. But something that Amy um, highlighted, in fact, I think Amy's work sort of codifies this, this idea of development is co collective. I'm going to show a movie from Suzanne Eaton, um, which um, is of the Drosophila wing. And um, this is a macroscopic structure. It's the kind of structure that you would be able to see with your eye and why I want to draw your idea to the idea that it's collective, you can see the veins sort of emerge, that you can't sort of simply break up final form, or for that matter, any phenotype, into just a bunch of few landmarks and treat them as independent. You really should be looking at the system in a much more holistic manner, which doesn't have landmarks, that's landmarks free, that, that is landmark free, and you let the data itself sort of tell you where the variants must lie. That all sounds a little bit opaque. Let's try to make that much more precise. Uh, so the system is this, and the reason uh, is that is because I have this uh, deep friendship with Rich, and um, he allows me to go into his, his lab and, and play around with things. Um, and also, it's two-dimensional. It's good to start uh, where, where things are simple. Flies are relatively easy to take care of, even for fools like me, um, even though I, I screw them up all the time. I've had fungal over, I've killed a lot of flies. Um, and um, a lot is known genetically about how this pattern is, uh, the system is patterned. In fact, we have a lot of stocks that we can simply order from Bloomington and I've leveraged a lot of that. Um, so that's the system. And the way landmarking works right now is that you kind of choose the things that, I, I'm pretty sure that if I asked the audience to say, hey, can you just put down a few points that you think codify, parameterize the phenotype, you'd probably choose these ones. They're where big dark structures meet other big dark structures, and those are referred to as landmarks, and in the wing, canonically, people use 12 of them. Um, and uh, so the approach goes as the following. This is what you do when you look at phenotype. You take, say, two wings that might be very different um, sized. You scale them to be the same area. You then uh, sort of align their center of masses, so to speak. So you put them sort of uh, uh, on top of each other, and then you rotate them. Um, and once you do that, um, you get a bunch of um, landmarks and you can look at the, the scatter of those landmarks. And so this is for one of these um, um, populations of flies that we have in the lab. For those who are slightly more uh, into the field, it's important to not look at the inbred fly lines that you typically have when you have these small vials. So we got 42 inbred fly lines from around the world and over a period of two years, we cross them into each other, producing a massive outbred population that lives in a huge cage in the lab. And so you don't have sort of these bottlenecking kind of things that can happen with very small populations. The effective population size is large. And okay, so that's what you get. You get these landmarks, you, uh, clouds of landmarks, and that's your variation in the developmental process. Uh, these were all raised similar diet, a rich diet, which is sort of standard protocol and 25 degrees Celsius. Okay. Um, just to show you exactly what you could do with this, well, now you can juxtapose male and females to each other. And of course, what you see is that they're different. Uh, you see that the clouds overlap, but they're distinct. And if you were to do principal component analysis, as people do, uh, you would see that, yeah, um, there's sexual dimorphism. In fact, sexual dimorphism is the primary mode of variation when you look at these two ensembles, these males and females together. Um, but I'm going to try to, for a second, I'm going to ask you to take my word for it, and then I'm going to show you some results. But I'm going to come up with a, a, a very different way of, of doing um, phenotyping, which is not landmark-based. I will, and the, I'm not going to go into the details of the mathematics. We have a, a, a paper now on bioarchive. But the idea is very simple. The, you use some 19th century mathematics that unfortunately all of us were, in fact, this was my, one of my favorite areas of mathematics when I learned it, which was complex analysis. 
But the mathematics doesn't really matter. What it allows you to do is bulk and boundary alignment and precision without using landmarks. So what the protocol involves is detecting the boundary of the wing. Um, you have to throw away the hinge because it turns out when you pluck, and I'm terrible at plucking, I didn't do all the experiments, but when you pluck these wings, the hinge area comes out quite variable just because sometimes it comes out with more and sometimes with less. So you have to sort of chop out the hinge area and we use some morphological landmarks to do that. That's a caveat. But other than that, the mathematics does the following. It will map every wing to a unit disk. And now what you can see is that once you have that, of course, uh, wings won't still necessarily align with each other because they might be rotated differently. You can also see that the region of focus, the sort of origin, the center of the disk might be focused at different regions of the wing. And it turns out there's a very straightforward way using that mathematics that can produce bulk alignment, meaning you can rotate them and you can align uh, the sort of center of attention, producing now, much like we, we do with proteins or nucleotides, an aligned ensemble of wings uh, that are both boundary and bulk aligned in the absence of landmarks. Um, so what can you do with that? So now I'm just going to, just like I showed you earlier what you can do with landmarks, I'm gonna show you, tell you something new that we learned. Um, so on the left, on the right is an image I've already showed you, which is just landmark variability across this population of outbred flies. On the left now is the entropy. Think about it as the pixel by pixel variance across this ensemble of hundreds of flies. These are the pixels, the heat in that map, the color in that map corresponds to which pixels are more or less variable. And what you see is something that developmental biologists have noted for, for centuries, development is damn robust. And in fact, how robust? You don't have to just look at landmarks now, you can even see the veins, you see railroads around every vein. What that means is that when you do this process of alignment that we've done, the amount of variation in the position of a vein on one of these, in, in, in a vein, across an ensemble of hundreds of wings is less than a vein width. That's how little it's moving. That's why you get railroads around the, the veins, because those are the only pixels that vary. Interestingly enough, the cross veins, I've highlighted them with little black arrows, the cross veins move a lot uh, from individual to individual. And that's why you see kind of a smear of heat where you have the cross veins versus these sort of uh, these other veins. Interesting point, which is not unrelated to later parts in this talk. Waddington uh, used the cross veinless phenotype in his famous but also infamous uh, genetic assimilation papers. So, so it's interesting that the cross wing uh, are the things that vary the most. Okay, but can we learn something new? Who cares about quantitative methods? You have to make discovery. So, so at least we see new things, and this is a very qualitative way of showing you that. When we now juxtapose males and females to each other, you remember what I showed you with regards to the landmarks. On the right now, that heat map, so to speak, is now asking which pixels are different across the males and the females. And what you can see, I hope you can see, is that the variation is not just at the landmarks. In fact, the variation varies along veins. That's the kind of variation that cannot be captured by landmarks, precisely because the landmarks are at the end of those veins. And what we're seeing is that almost the dominant mode of sexual dimorphism is, a is variation that occurs along veins, not just sort of straddled to the landmarks. Um, okay, so um, just to now give you some sort of geography of what we've done through this method, when you did landmarking and you had these 12 landmarks, their X and Y coordinates, you had this 12 times two 24 dimensional space that was your phenotype. That was your, the way you thought about phenotype. Now what we've done by doing this alignment scheme and landmark free way, phenotype space now is enormous. How enormous? It's as enormous as the number of pixels in your image in that disk. So in this case, it's tens of thousands that's the dimensionality in which phenotype lives now. So I want you to think now, imagine I just picked up three pixels from this disk and I looked at those, the values of those three pixels across my entire ensemble of flies. I can imagine now plotting on dimension one, two, and three, the intensity of those pixels. And you can imagine some cloud of points living that incredibly high dimensional space. I'm just giving you a three dimensional 
kind of lens a lie into what that space might look like. You can imagine that space looking pretty crazy. And in fact, that space is interesting because that is the space we would like to understand. It's telling you what are the kind of varieties that development can generate. Um, here's uh, fact, uh, sort of juxtaposition one or difference one. When we did the landmark-based principal component analysis, sexual dimorphism was the most dominant mode of variation. When you do the landmark free analysis in this very high dimensional space, it's the second component. It is not the dominant contributor to variation. In fact, there's a mode which seems to be overwhelmingly hold the variance in, this, in these cloud of points. The rest of the talk is trying to tell you what that new direction is. I took um, a way to trying to answer that uh, by leveraging the fact that I'm working in the fly that allows me to look at different genotypes because I can just order them. Okay, so here's the, what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my flies, I'm going to alter their genomes, and I'm going to alter them in a way I'll just tell you, but what that will produce is a change in where the cloud is. Instead of now this clouded green, you can imagine I changed, a, a, introduced a mutation of some sort, and now I produce a cloud that lives somewhere else or somewhere else in orange. And what I want to ask is the following question. Are the dominant modes of variation in a population, in the reference population in green here, which I've labeled as PC1, does it align with the kind of phenotype that is generated by mutations? Okay, that's the question I want to ask. Um, so um, actually I, one important point to note, flies aren't, uh, sorry, this is a physicist, I'll say, flies aren't worms. What that means is that you don't have a clonal population of flies in a, in a, in a cage. So you can't have isogenic flies because they sexually recombine. So, so the variation that you produce when I say, oh, I fix the diet and I fix the temperature and the genome is wild type, that doesn't mean it's the same. They aren't twins of each other. They aren't clones. There is standing variation in that population. So when you see a cloud of points that is being generated by genomic variation, but let me even tell you, it's produced by environmental variation because those larvae, once they come out, go into different little parts of those vials doing different little things and there's behavior involved. So the variation that you see in a fly population is very complicated. You should not think about it as only due to stochasticity, for example, or something. It is due to cannot, real differences in the genome and the environment. Okay, so I want to do this comparison, right? Are mutant phenotypes related to the directions of variation in the reference population? So here are the four mutants I looked at. Some of them have names that many of you recognize, EGFR, thick veins, mastermind, these are in some of the famous signaling pathways that are known contributors uh, to vein patterning and, and wing formation. Um, and let me tell you about what these mutants are. These mutants are mutants that most, that people think have no phenotype. So they are P element insertions into the promoter regions of these genes, meaning that at best they can affect um, expression. But then we, they are back crossed into a wild type and they are the recessive allele. So these are incredibly weak perturbations to the genomic state and believed to have no phenotype. Meaning that if you use the canonical landmark based approach, you can't even see an effect of perturbing the genome. I report to tell you that's absolutely not true. There is a phenotype and you just need a high precision instrument to be able to see that phenotype. And yet again, once you align everything uh, in the ways that I've described, what I'm plotting to you are literally the purple and orange lines. They are the vectors, the directions in phenotype space you must walk to go from wild type to the mutant. So these are the, the vectors in which you should, this is the phenotype. This is the perturbed phenotype from the wild type. Okay, and now I can do something very simple. I can just try to measure the angles between these mutant phenotype directions and the directions of variation in a population. And here's what you see incredible alignment with the first principal component. So all these mutant directions, and these mutants are in completely different pathways. I mean, careers and institutions are built on studying EGFR pathway. Thick veins is related to something that Amy spoke about. It is the Drosophila uh, homolog receptor for the BMP ligand, which is referred to as DPP in the fly. So these are, these are some of the genes that everyone should care about 
And yet, when you perturb them just slightly, they produce very similar phenotypic changes that align with the direction of maximum variation that we saw in an otherwise wild type population. Um, I will come back to this. The, what, we're meant to be quantitative, so why is that one not, why is male stars not working out? I will come back to that. Um, but Waddington made an even crazier claim. He said, regardless of variation in condition, meaning that even if you change the environment, forget if you change the genes, even if you change the environment, that should perturb the system in a similar way to if you change the genes. That's a crazy hypothesis, but we went and did it. So then you can produce uh, uh, flies whose mothers and the population has been raised at regular temperature, but just the eggs have uh, been, uh, just, just the, those individuals that we've now assayed are allowed to develop an altered temperature. So 25 is the usual thing you use in a lab. So we did 18, 29, and then we did one population that was at 25, but a restricted diet. Um, and again, same thing. You ask, how are the phenotype, the phenotypic changes that are brought about by environmental perturbations, how are they related to the natural variation in a reference wild type population? And again, you see that they all seem to align with one direction, the direction of the dominant mode of variation in the reference. And again, aren't we meant to be quantitative? So what's going on? Why are these, these variations? I should be able to explain them if I really think there's something going on here. Um, I haven't said much about statistics. Uh, I have half an hour to talk about this, uh, only to assure you that I have done more bootstrapping and shuffling to convince myself that all the features are statistically robust. Uh, you can look at the bioarchive for details. I'd love to talk if there are questions about that, of course. But we've been very careful to actually see whether these trends are, are real or just a consequence of finite numbers because of our poor sampling. Um, I assure you it's not. Um, so um, let's explain these quantitative differences. So here's a hypothesis. What if, and I'm going to try to explain these quantitative differences that we saw in the degree of alignment. In particular, why sometimes do you have, for example, male star mutants not aligning with the direction of maximal variation? Um, so imagine, if you will, a, a, a fake model. It's not, it's, it's, a, it's a, just a, a thought experiment. Imagine all these variants, um, the natural variation, the variants that are produced by deforming the genome, by, by altering the gen genome, by altering the environment, lie along a one-dimensional data manifold in this incredibly high dimensional space. Just imagine that. So it has one long direction and then some smear in the orthogonal directions. This is not very dissimilar to you and me sitting on a train, which we used to do uh, before pandemic happened. And you know, maybe Danelle is sitting next to me and Noah is sitting, I don't know, five compartments down. If I measure the angle between myself and Noah, it's actually going to align with the direction of the, the train itself, just because, well, he's along this, this train and he's very far away. Danelle, on the other hand, is very close to me. Let's just say she's on the same row, but on the other side of the train. Her angle can completely be orthogonal to the direction of the train. That's just parallax. Someone is close to me, and so they, they can vary their angle with respect to the sort of long axis of the train more than if Noah just changed which row he was on very far away. In fact, that angle wouldn't change much. Let me state it as a biologist. It's saying that the degree of alignment should have be a function of the size of the phenotype, the, the size effect, the phenotypic effect size, right? So the stronger the phenotypic effect, alignment should be stronger just because of this geometric property. And the closer you are in phenotype, the weaker the phenotype, hey, now those constraints aren't as binding and you can really have variation. I won't go, I think this is my only equation um, in, in the whole thing. I'm not even going to go into how I derived it, but you can imagine that that's just some high school trig, right? Some trigonometry where you simply go, okay, how many carriages down? How much can the angle vary, et cetera, right? And it turns out um, there should be a particular dependence between the angle, uh, in particular, the square root of one minus cosine squared of the angle. I hope those things remind you of trig when you were younger. Um, like, you know, the square roots kept showing up in cosine squares. That's just doing tan and cosine and stuff. There should be that, a relationship with the square root of one minus cosine theta and the effect size one over, uh, in, in an inverse manner, one over R. 
And when you plot all the data now, I'm gonna now show you a plot where I show you genomic mutants, environmental perturbations, and I will have on the X axis, the size of the phenotype, R, the distance in phenotype space, and on the Y axis, I'll have this funky square root of one minus cosine squared, and there should be an inverse relationship. Um, so on the left are mutants, and on the right are environment. Kind of, and, and by the way, I come from an area of physics and applied math that you shouldn't talk about power laws because you win Nobel Prizes when you, when you discover power laws. So I will not talk about power law fitting. I will simply tell you that the data is not inconsistent with this hypothesis, that there's a long direction to the data manifold. And all the data that we're producing seems to be consistent with the fact that there is a long access to the variants that are being produced generically by all these different kinds of perturbations. And the smaller the phenotype effect size, then the constraints are released because now you're sort of almost in an isotropic space and you can explore phenotypes more freely. So it seems like statistically the evidence is that you have a one-dimensional data manifold with a small amount of sphere in a uh, smear in directions orthogonal to it. So what does this mean? Uh, that's the most important question, you know. Um, how do you generalize? I mean, is this, do I think this is just true of wings? I obviously don't, but I don't have data in other organisms to convince you of that, but what does it mean? Um, so here's what I think it means. I will try to give you intuition through a metaphor, and then I will formalize it in terms of some mathematics. But the intuition is, remember when we used to go on water slides when we were A free and B young? Um, but when you did that, um, you would end up at the bottom of the slide. And the idea is, what the data seems to be showing, imagine slide is the developmental process, this crazy dynamical system in space and time using mechanics and chemistry does some crazy walk, and then it ends up at final form. What Waddington, I think, was trying to say, and I think what our data with the wing is beginning to confirm, is that for small effect perturbations in that developmental process, genomic or environmental, all that changes is where that person ends up at the bottom of the slide in terms of, did that person just come out and plop right down there and stop? Or was there more sort of, did they end up sort of further along? So here or here? That seems to be what we're seeing, that small effect perturbations really um, only seem to be affecting where final form, so to speak, ends, rather than something uh, bigger. Uh, bigger mutations, uh, the ones that are famous that you do screens for and that we all study, those are different slides. Those end up at different phenotypes. So when you really hit the genome or you really hit the environment with a big effect, that changes the developmental process massively. But that's not relevant. That's not what's happening in evolution. In evolution, you have small amounts of variation in the environment and the genome, in particular the kinds of variation that you've seen in your historical evolutionary past, producing only slight deformation of final form. I can try to make this argument precise in terms of mathematics, a beautiful paper written by a friend of mine, Arvind Murugan. I will simply very quickly tell you that the way to formalize the water slide analogy or metaphor is uh, you, the, 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 it means that the fixed point at the end of the dynamical, uh, at the end of the de developmental process in this very high dimensional dynamical system has a soft mode. That is the only instance in which a generic perturbation to the dynamical system leads to collinear variation in the fixed point. So the, the fixed point will move along the soft mode. So that's just a, a bit of a formal comment, um, but it leads to a prediction that I think um, is intuitive. It's saying that if I go back to one of Suzanne Eaton movies and I look at the flow of these movies at these end points of development when the wing is coming into its being, so to speak. Well, that is the end points of the slide. And the flow, so to speak, by that I literally mean cell flow, the prediction is it should align with the direction that I have detected in the data manifold by producing variants genomically and environmentally. They should align. So there should be a duality between dynamics in development and the kind of varieties that are produced um, across individuals. Um, we're also looking at different species. I have the four species that were part of the Madagascar radiation, Mauritania, Seychellia, Similans, um, because of course this has environmental predictions, uh, evolutionary predictions, so I'm checking that. Um, 
And then I'll just stop there. Let me most importantly uh, thank Vasil and, and uh, Jamie and Rich. Uh, Vasil was sort of the driver of all of this and did a lot of the, the experiments and imaging himself as well. And Rich was a, just a fantastic colleague and friend. Um, I, and I want to thank uh, 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 sort of KITP. I was a postdoc there and I just want to say that uh, it was a fantastic place to be a postdoc. Uh, I learned more from Boris than um, I probably still didn't realize. Um, and I will just finish with a statement that strong effect mutants of the kind that you see on the left here, which have strong effects on, you know, veins go missing, the shape, the wing is sort of missing. That has been part of our intellectual sort of heritage for a while, and it has taught us every so much about what we know about how signaling and patterning and development works. I think you can learn a different thing when you look at much more subtle changes to the genome and the environment. I think you can learn something perhaps more, um, I'm not sure actually what the difference is, but you learn different things. And asking about how that, this direction, if it's real, which I'm still trying to every day convince myself of, how is that genomically encoded? Um, and how does it evolve? Um, okay, I will stop there. Uh, there's a paper on bioarchive on this. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Mata. Um, we have time for questions and Boris. But I've, uh, thank you for the wonderful talk and the beautiful piece of work. So I'm excited here. So- Boris, I can't see your face. Yeah, I know the video isn't working, but you're not missing much. Uh, <clears throat> um, but can you hear me? Yeah, totally. Okay. Um, so did you just say that uh, looking at uh, that wing movie, uh, the your principal component slow mode actually corresponds to the time dimension? So if you compare uh, time points, you actually see variation aligned uh, along your slow, uh, soft mode? Boris, that is the thing that we are doing now. I, 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 I can simply tell you I quantitatively, I can't give you that answer yet, but that is that is just such an important prediction that we're going for now. Yeah, sorry. It, it, is, it is certainly suggestive that the, your most variable elements are the transverse veins, which happen to be perpendicular to the direction of, uh, of the flow, right? This has, not, uh, this has not gone missed for us. This yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Great, thank you. But, 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 but Boris, maybe I can add something to that. Most of us spend, I mean, most of my work on the eye and things like this, we look at dynamics. We don't look at final form. Dynamics are interesting. That's where the signaling systems are, on, on, are sort of, that's where the thing is being built. So um, there is the, another project that I have, and actually I don't have anyone to do this, but uh, I've started to do it myself, is try to use this kind of high dimensional phenotyping in a landmark freeway to look at dynamics of development, not final form, but to actually look at movies of things developing. I have yeah. particular movies in mind, I've started that. And again, goes back to very uh, important ideas that Darwin had on heterochrony, uh, which is that where's the variance? If I had a thousand movies that I could line perfectly in space and time, where's the variance developmentally? Um, are there particular checkpoints of gastrulation and neurulation? Is that where the variance is? And you have bottlenecks and variants at those important mm -hmm. developmental stages. And that's why famous people have called them stages is because there's an invariance at that point or what is it? So my, I always have, I've always wanted to go to dynamics because I think that's the rich phenomena uh, and, and that's where I'm going next. Um, okay, another question from Nicholas. Hi, um, thanks for the, the talk, it was, uh really pretty pretty amazing. So I have a statistics-based uh, question. Um, so I believe you very much when you say that all of your conclusions are really significant mm -hmm. and you've uh, done a lot to double check. Yeah. But I, what I would like to know is sort of what kind of sample size did yeah. you need to see these effects? What kind of sample size did you need? How many wings, uh, mm -hmm. how many wing images did you need to see this aligned with the first principal component? Okay, um, first let me give you the numbers. Uh, typically, um, so the way we did this is we, we uh, actually kept left and right separate and we know, so we, we, we kept that separate. Uh, but um, for every ensemble, that meaning of four mutants, 
our, our four mutants, our reference wild type population, and the three perturbed environmental systems, we had ballpark between 200 and 300 images for males and females in each of those populations. You're asking a much more general question, which is actually unanswerable unless you simply do a shuffle uh, statistic, um, which is, in general, when you have a high dimensional space and you have points in it, of course, there's the curse of dimensionality, right? You need an exponentially large amount of data to actually populate that space, unless the data actually live in, lives intrinsically in a lower dimensional space. Um, so it's very hard for me in general to answer the question, how many images or movies do you need to discover the salient statistical properties? There is no answer to that question, unless the data is low dimensional itself, how do I know that we're statistically uh, robust? You can do things like bootstrap and shuffle and simply see. Right, um, right, right. right. I, I, I totally agree. And what I wanted to ask is, is sort of for your example, like how many, yes. how many images did it take for you in your particular example yes. to see? I would uh, say the answer, so of course it's not a precise answer. There's not a phase transition at some value. Sure, like somewhere roughly. between 20 and 50. Okay. Somewhere between 20 and 50, we went way, I was just paranoid, so I just, I just it's got. It's good to be paranoid. Yeah, I just got, and I still think I'm being tricked. So, I mean, I'm, it's still a hypothesis. So, there you go. Um, Matthias? Yeah, so, uh, so thanks a lot, Amada, for really interesting. Um, my question is related to Boris's question, right? And it's just um, really about these cross range, right? And how far yeah. is the of all variants related to the cross lanes and yes. are the two cross lane positions correlated with each other so that you will end up with a single, uh, you know, with a single component. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, well, uh, again, uh, I can only uh, say two things. Uh, Boris, right away, so the, the, the most striking feature in that movie, which is that, hey, the flow is uh, dragging the cross veins because they are transverse. They are the things that deform, that move the most in that movie at the end of development. That's why I'm seeing all, most, not all, but quantitatively, a lot of the variation. That's a striking yeah. feature. Mm -hmm. And please remember what Waddington did in his genetic assimilation papers. Mm -hmm. He stressed populations of flies to produce a phenotype and then remove that stressor to see if the phenotype had fixed. The phenotype was cross veinless. The cross veins went away. It's just interesting to me that that's the one that showed up because, but, but that's just a hypothesis. Who knows? I'm probably wrong. Mm -hmm. but, uh, okay. but it's not just that there are cross veins uh, uh, and well, one happens to see it uh, maybe that way. But uh, the strong statement is that uh, there is one mode yes. as opposed to yes. 15 yes. modes. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly. And uh, yeah. that is, uh, that is non-trivial. So, yeah. Dynamical systems theory tells us that, uh, you know, there are fixed points generically and the rest is not generic. I believe me, I know. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So the fact that there is just one is, uh, is, uh, but no, actually, let me say there are two, but the second one is sexual dimorphism, male, female. So I have already shown, it's not like everything is okay. So here was my worry for the longest time, Boris. Is this whole mumbo jumbo of complex analysis, this alignment producing a fictitious spurious dimension? No, sure. male, female are bang orthogonal to this long axis. In fact, if you look at the two male and female uh, data manifolds, they're almost sort of parallel to each other, but they're distinct from each other. So it's, it, there are other directions and one of them is, and it seems like the other one is sexual dimorphism. Uh, what can I, that's what the data seems to be telling me so far. Okay, we've got a couple more questions. Um, Sundar. Uh, hi. Um, have, have, you, have you looked at uh, left-right variation in wings? There so is none statistical. We, we preserved left-right variation. Famously in Drosophila, there's not meant to be left-right differences between uh, way, uh, the, the, the wings. We wanted to look at that. We preserved left and right separately and noted which one was which. Um, no, when you look at variation across those ensembles, there is no left-right patterning. Okay, because a lot of people have looked at uh, fluctuating asymmetry of, of fly course. wings, and they do see very, uh, like, you know, of course, you want to keep as little variation as possible between your left and right sides. 
but fluctuating asymmetry is not the same as there being a difference. Fluctuating asymmetry simply means that left and right are different from each other. What I'm saying is that when you look at, say, the right of a population to its left, there's no actual, like the way your heart is on one side, there's no actual left-right patterning. Of course, there are fluctuations, but there's okay. no patterning, so to speak. Yeah. No, fluctuating asymmetry is an important, very important. Cool. Thanks a lot. Okay, and one more question from David. Uh, hey, Madhav, that was really beautiful. So um, I guess I'm wondering, so most of the mutants you showed us, if I remember correctly, were things that one thinks act during patterning in the larval stage, thus before these and movies. Pupil. And pupil. And, and pupil, but, but mostly before the 30 hours APF where, where um, you showed Suzanne's movies. I believe right. the notch pathway there. is uh, central to vein uh, uh, refinement at pupil stage. Okay. Um, well, so so then maybe maybe this is the question. No, no, but ask your question. It's well, relevant for others. So, I mean, I guess the question is whether if you had mutants that clearly affected the late stages of this flow process, would they also uh, sit along the same axis, or you know, you might expect it that they would then sit along other direction. Um, of course, these flies had the mutation. So, and so to speak, wherever EGFR was being used, I mean, this was the genome that was sitting there. So it was affecting the entire developmental process. Your point is taken whether you could conditionally drive it at different times in development and, and so to speak, ask if there are variations. I think you're getting at the dynamics question, which I think is just the most important one. Um, well, I, I guess I'm asking, is, is what's happening that you have many dimensions of variation and it sort of gets collapsed by yeah. late, late um, processes like, like this elongation? Or was it, and, and in that case, if you messed up the elongation, you would right. see it have more dimensions? Um, um, first of all, let me report to you that environment also aligned, environmental perturbation. So it needs to sit in your intellectual framework okay. somewhere, yeah. even environment. No, no, that's, yeah, and that's, that's a good. generic yeah. uh, effect rather than something yeah. that is sort of stage dependent. On the other hand, you're absolutely right. Perhaps final form, so to speak, as Boris talks about it, it is non-generic property of a dynamical system. Maybe final form is just special. And if you looked at earlier stages, you wouldn't have such structure. I expect that, but the only way I will answer that is by getting data and attacking the movies, which I am doing now. Certainly, absolutely. All right, thanks, that was really nice. Okay, so if there are no further questions. I, I have one if you if there's mm -hmm. time. Oh, so sure. Mara, um, this is great. Uh, I am curious about um, when you make this analogy, this piggybacks off Boris's question too, uh, when you make this analogy with the epistasis model from Arvind, yeah. um, so there, yeah, if, if I understand correctly, it's very important that there is one, there's one mode whose eigenvalue is much, much uh, uh, is far away from the rest of the cluster of eigenvalues. And this is in contrast to the class of models, for instance, by like Jim Sefna and mm -hmm. colleagues, where you have you know evenly spaced in mm -hmm. logarithmic Log scale. Mm -hmm. um, so have you looked? You showed us PCA, you know, variance um, linear scale. So I'm I'm curious if you have sort of cast this into a, uh, some sort of eigenvalue spectrum in a log scale to see whether it really is one mode far away from the rest of the cluster, or if they could be even so It based. looks like that on the linear, but I never took the log. Uh, I can't therefore rep answer your question quantitatively. Um, uh, I, I haven't done that. That's a good idea, Noah. Uh, but I can tell you on a linear scale, it really looks like there's one and then the rest of them. It doesn't. Right. Look. Yeah, I think there. this might uh, require your large numbers that, and yeah. your which right. you have taken the pains to, yeah. right. to look good... at. Thank you. Okay, well, with that, I would like to sp thank the speakers in this session for some really stimulating talks and the participants for a great discussion. Um, Noah or Ayal, do you wanna have any, make any closing remarks before we go away for the day? Uh, well, I think this has been an excellent uh, conference. I, I, uh, I suppose 
the KITP uh, will be sending out um, some sort of uh, follow-up um, address to get some more information about um, the impact of uh, the two-day conference. So look out for that uh, in your spam folder if necessary. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for making this a reality and making this a lively discussion. Yes, and I'll, I'll just mention again that the talks, uh, most of the talks on last day speakers requested otherwise are uploaded to the KTP website and uh, talks from yesterday, in case you missed them, are already there. So you can binge through the weekend. <laughs> And uh, speaking for KITP, if I may, uh, let me thank uh, all the speakers, participants, and uh, our organizers, and I'll clap for everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Boris. Thanks, Boris. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you very much.